Are you hearing me, folks? Um, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, folks, so a uh, couple of announcements today before we get started. Uh, our second exam will be a week from Thursday, and it's going to be a multiple choice exam. The, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to post it on Moodle. Uh, and I'm gonna post it for, I'm gonna to try to make it available to you for two hours on that day. It's not gonna be a two hour exam. It should be the same length as a normal exam, but you're gonna have a two hour window in which to work on it. Uh, you'll, uh, it, so I'll post it about 11.30 on that Thursday. Uh, and then it will be taken down at about 1.30 on that day. Okay, so you have that two hour window to work on it. Um, you will just uh, write down your answers, which since it's multiple choice, the answers will be like A, B, whatever, whatever the choice is on the answer. And then uh, you'll have to, I'll figure out a way for you to, to give those to me. You might just have to take a picture and show it to me or you know, send me the file, uh, something like that, or you'll, uh, if I can find some kind of online thing that you can fill out and you can put your answers in that, I'll do that as well. So I have to look at some of the features on Moodle to see what we can do. Um, and your homework assignment is due Friday. So do you have any questions? For, oh, there's a review sheet for the exam up on Moodle now. So any questions for me? All right, so I'm going to switch over. All 
All right, so. All right, so we're gonna to return to what we were talking about last time. So we've been talking about, we started talking about these exponential functions. So this is, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're covering sections 3.1 through 3.3, kind of as a big chunk, because I'm kind of jumping around in these sections. So we defined what we mean by an exponential function. with base a and so it's a function that looks like this f of x equals a to the x and we put some restrictions on a we don't let a just be anything it has to be positive it can't be equal to one we talked about all this last time and what i was doing is i was talking about now uh was something called the natural exponential function So it looks like this, f of x equals e to the x. So it's just an exponential function using this mysterious base e, which is an irrational number. Out to the first few decimal places, it's 2.71828, but it's irrational. The decimal expansion goes on forever. So it turns out that this is a very nice base to use for exponential functions. And you're about to see why this weird number is a good base for these exponential functions. Um, but this is an exponential function, okay? It still has the same properties as the others. So the domain is all real numbers or you could write it as the interval from minus infinity to infinity. And then the range is uh, like zero to infinity, not including the zero. The graph, it's an exponential function. So its graph is just that of an exponential function. The base is bigger than one. So that means it increases as we go from left to right. It's also going to cross the y-axis at one, as do all the exponential functions. Okay? So that's some basic properties of this natural exponential function. Now, the big question, since this is calculus, is what's the derivative of this? So what is d by dx of e to the x? And what we're going to do is we will eventually get to the derivatives of general exponential functions, but for right now, we're just going to deal with the derivative of this natural exponential function. Okay, now, this is, it looks like a power, but it, it looks like you'd be doing a power rule or something, but this is a different situation than the power rule. The power rule, you dealt with functions that look like this, x to the a power. So you have an exponent, but x is your uh, x is down here. X is being raised to the power of this exponent. This is the other way around. You have a number down here, a fixed number, and the variable x is up here. So this is actually a new type of function as far as derivatives are concerned. So to compute the derivative, what we're going to do is we have to go to the definition. That's the only tool we have. So the derivative of e to the x is going to be the limit as h goes to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take f of x plus h. Now that's going to be e to the x plus h. And then minus f of x, that's going to be just e to the x all over h. Okay, so that's what the definition of derivative looks like in this context. Now, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to, I mean, there's different things you could try to do, but I'm going to, 
I'm going to rewrite this first term as e to the x times e to the h. And you can do that from properties of exponents. When you multiply these together, you add the exponents, and it'll come out to be that. And then we've still got this minus e to the x. All righty. And so what I can then do is I can factor an e to the x out of the numerator. That's going to leave me with e to the h minus 1. I factored out e to the x. Now, in the limit, uh, there's two variables. There's h and there's x. But as far as the limit is concerned, h is the variable. Anything that doesn't depend on, on h can be treated as a constant, including this e to the x. So I could factor e to the x out of everything and What I'm left with is the limit as h goes to 0 of e to the h minus 1 over h. Now, this, so you can see that knowing what the derivative of e to the x is depends on us knowing what this limit is. So, If you take the limit as h goes to 0 of e to the h minus 1, oops, e to the h minus the 1 is down here, all over h. Uh, so this is not something that we can actually, whose limit we can compute using any of our limit laws. It's, um, it's kind of like the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of 8, or sine of x, x goes to 0 of sine of x over x. That didn't, you couldn't do that from any of our limit laws. It was something we just had to kind of know what it was. And we did it from a table. So if you use a table, and I'll let you do this on your own, but if you were to make a table, so if I took h and then e to the h minus one over h, so h is going to zero. So you can take like 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and so on. And what you'll see is that these numbers, these will approach one. So these will approach one. And the same thing happens. And you could try this in Excel if you want, or just on a calculator. Same thing happens. Uh, if you were to pick negative values, so minus 0.1, minus 0 0.01, minus 0 0.001, and so on. So it turns out that this limit is equal to one. And so what that means is, here we have it. If you take the derivative of e to the x, so it's equal to e to the x times the value of this limit. The value of this limit is one. So the derivative of e to the x is equal to e to the x. That is, when you take the derivative of e to the x, you just get the same thing back. And it's this property right here, that e to the x is equal to its own derivative, that makes this such a, a valuable function, that makes this the natural exponential function. It's because of this that this will grow, this function appears in a lot of physical contexts. Um, and it's because there's a lot of physical situations that are modeled with these things called differential equations. And differential equations are, well, let me just, I'm going to write one down for you. This is, if you take this equation, dy by dx equals k times y. 
So this is an example of a differential equation. This is one that's used to model population growth. What you're looking for to solve this differential equation is you're looking for a function. And you want, what do you want to be true about this function is you want the derivative of this function to be k times the original function. Uh, and so if you are thinking about y as something that's changing with x and say x is time, y, if y were a population, this is saying that the growth rate of a population is equal to a constant times the size of the population. There's a name for this, it's called the Malthusian growth model and actually, um, and it turns out that the solutions to this involve these exponential functions. So, uh, and this is because of this kind of thing and this property, it's like the way like the increase in the number of cases in the coronavirus has been following exponential curves for a while. And it's because, uh, because of this, it follows this kind of differential equation. The growth rate is proportional to the size of the population. Anyway. So you don't, you have to know this, okay? And it's nice to know the stuff I had written over here, but that's not essential for us at this moment. Well, I guess it kind of is since we're living in, a, you know, in the world we're living in at the moment. So now with the chain rule, well, so let me just do a couple of examples. Now you could of course combine uh, this now with some of our other differentiation formulas. So if you wanted, if you had a function like this, y equals x cubed times e to the x, and you wanted to take the derivative of this. So this is now two functions whose derivatives you know how to compute, and you would use the product rule. So you would take the first, times the derivative of the second. Now the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. So it's x cubed times e to the x plus e to the x, so the second, times the derivative of the first. So times 3x squared. So this is the derivative. If you wrote this down, it would, uh, I mean, that would be correct. I would probably write it this way, x cubed e to the x plus, and it's like with trig functions, I think it looks nicer if constants and powers of x are before these exponentials. So I'd write this as 3x squared times e to the x. So I'd probably, I would write it this way. <clears throat> so any questions about that? Now, what you could do then is you could combine this with the chain rule. And what you would have is then if you had d by dx of not just e to the x, but let's say we had e to the g of x. So we had something up here in the exponent more complicated than just an x. So with the chain rule, what you would do, so the outer function is now the exponential. So you first take the derivative of the exponential. So you have e to the g of x, but then you multiply by the derivative of the inner function. And now the inner function is this g of x. So it's gonna be times the g prime of x. So I would probably write this as g prime of x times e to the g of x. So the derivative of e to the g of x is g prime of x times e to the g of x. So let me do an example, a couple of the examples using that. So let's say we wanted to take the derivative of something like f of x equals e to the negative x cubed. So if this were just e to the x, the derivative would be e to the x. Because of the negative x cubed up there, you're going to have to use the chain rule. So what you're going to get is e to the negative x cubed, 
when you take the derivative of an exponential, it will always come back in the same form, but then times the derivative of the exponent. So times negative three x squared. which uh, I would pull that in front. So it'd be negative three X squared times E to the minus X cubed. And then of course you could start combining this with other differentiation formulas like the product rule. So let's say we had y equals, and let's say we had a, uh, let's say we had a cosine of x times e to the tangent of x. If you want to take the derivative of that, so you're going to get y primed equals. So you're going to have to use the product rule. So you have cosine of x times d by dx of e to the tangent of x plus e to the tangent of x. So that's the second times the derivative of the first. And the first is the cosine of x. So you'd get times negative sine of x. And so this is going to leave me with a, that's going to leave me with, uh, now I've still got this derivative right here. So I've got a cosine of x times an e to the tangent of x. Now the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x. So I've used the chain rule on this. I've got, when I take the derivative of e to the tangent of x, I've got e to the tangent of x times derivative of tangent of x. On this other term, I'm going to, I'm going to pull the sign in front. I think trig functions look better if they're in front of the exponentials. And then to maybe clean it up a bit at the very end. So I'm going to come back up to this part of the board. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this secant squared in front with the cosine. So I'm going to have a cosine of x times a secant squared of x times an e to the tangent of x. And then you have minus sine of x times e to the tangent of x. And so you could leave the derivative this way. There's actually another simplification you could do here. Uh, you could actually, this is one over cosine squared. So you could actually cancel a cosine out if you wanted to. I'm going to leave it that way right now. Notice that when I took the derivative, I started, there was an e to the tangent of x when I started. And at no point do you get anything other than e to the tangent of x anywhere. So when you start with e to the tangent of x, you're just going to keep getting e to the tangent of x. You'll never get e to something else. It's, things appear in the expression because of that tangent of x, but that e to the tangent of x stays e to the tangent of x. So, any questions about that? Yeah. All right. So we're gonna get we're gonna get eventually two derivatives of all of the exponential functions. But before we can do that, we need to talk about inverse functions. And before we can talk about inverse functions, I need a definition. So we're trying to get to inverse functions, but a function
f is one to one if f of x1 is not equal to f of x2 whenever x1 is not equal to x2. Now, let me just say that in a, a little clearer way, I hope. Okay, so this is what the definition is. If f of x1 is not equal to f of x2 whenever x1 is not equal to x2. So what this is saying is that the, a function's one-to-one -one if whenever you substitute two different things in for x, that the function evaluates to two different numbers. Another way of stating it is, and this other definition is a little bit, so equivalently, if um, x1 is equal to x2 whenever f of x1 is equal to f of x2. This will be convenient at times. So let me give you a couple of examples. And I think to start with, with one-to-oneness, I think that um, it's easier if I start with examples where it's not one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to say, let's say we had f of x equals x squared plus 2. So this function is not one to one. And so the question is why? So a function is gonna be one to one if uh, whenever you substitute two different x values in, you always get two different y values out. A function is not gonna be one to one if it's possible to find two different x values that you can put in, which will give you the same y value. So notice, so there's a lot of choices we can make here, but one of the same thing, what, the one thing you could notice here is that f of one is gonna be one squared plus two, which is three, and then f of negative one. Now that's gonna be negative one squared plus two, but that's also gonna be equal to three. So what we have is that f of one is equal to f of negative one. So what we have is that two different x values produce the same function value. And if that happens, the function's not one to one. There wasn't anything magic about it being one and negative one. I could have used two and negative two or three and negative three or one half and negative one half. You would have gotten the same kind of result. So this function is not one to one. Um, I'm going to erase this right here. I'll do another one. So if you take f of x equals sine of x, this is not one to one as well. Uh, and so it's the same thing. Can we find, it's not going to be one to one if it's possible to find two different x values that give you the same function value. And so there's a lot of choices you can make here. 
Uh, but let's notice that if you take f of pi, so that's sine of pi, and that's zero. And then if you were to take, you could take f of zero, or f of two pi would work. But let's say you take f of zero, so that's sine of zero, which is zero. And so what we have is that two different x values are giving you the same function value. And that's all you need to show it's not one to one. All you have to do is find one pair of x values that where the x values are different and the function values are the same. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, I want to show you an example where it is one to one. So, uh, so let's do another example. So let's say we have f of x equals x cubed minus four. So my claim is this is one to one. Okay, so uh, so how do you show that something is one to one? Okay, so what we're going to have to use is that that definite that second part of the definition. So let's let x one and x two be x values, and we're going to suppose. that x1, oops, I'm going to suppose that f of x1, I know when I do those smudges, it doesn't show up very well. So f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. No, sorry, I keep doing this wrong. I'm going to suppose that f of x1 equals f of x2. Okay, so what we do is we pick two x values. And we suppose that if I evaluate the function at those two x values, I get exactly the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if this is true, then there's something else that has to be true. And if that thing is true, then there's something else that has to be true and so on. And what we want to be led to is, and I'm going to write this down at the board, but I got to fill in a gap. What I want to be led to is the conclusion that x1 is equal to x2. That is, if this is true, then this must be true. And that says that the function is one to one, because what that means is that the only way to get, um, so whenever the function, the only way to get two different y values out is to have two different x values. What, what it means is that putting two different x values in always produces two different y values, because this says if the y values are the same, then the x values must be the same. All right, so, uh, so let's see how this plays out in, in this context. So what I'm going to do is if, what I'm going to do is write down what this tells us using my specific function here. So this says that x1 cubed minus 4 is equal to x2 cubed minus 4. So if this is true, this must be true. And that's just the definition of the function. Now, here I could add 4 to both sides. And I would have x1 cubed equals x2 cubed. If x1 cubed is equal to x2 cubed, then that means that the cube root of both sides is the same.
And if you take the cube root of x1 cubed, you just get x1. And if you take the cube root of x2 cubed, you just get x2. So the next thing we could say is that x1 is equal to x2. So supposing that this is correct, supposing this is true, leads us inescapably to this being true. Now, what would have happened if we had tried that with one of our other earlier examples? So why wouldn't that have worked? So why wouldn't this work with f of x equals, so what was that first example I did? It was x squared plus, and I just made this example up. It was x squared probably plus two or something. So I'm gonna say that. So why wouldn't this same thing work? So let's try it. Okay, so let's suppose that f of x1 equals f of x2. So if we used the x squared plus 2, we would have x1 squared plus 2 equals x2 squared plus 2. So I'm doing the same kind of thing I did over here. Now you could subtract two from both sides. Everything's good so far. But then if you start trying to take the square root of both sides to get rid of those squares, here's where the snag's gonna come in. Uh, it's that, and I don't know if we've talked about this yet in here, but if you take the square root of a squared, oops, I've written that over in the, the zone that's off the screen. So if you take uh, the square root of a squared, that's not equal to a. It's actually equal to the absolute value of a. So when you take the square root of a square, you get absolute value of a. And that's because you see this A could be positive, it could be negative. You, when you square it, you get a positive number. Uh, but when you take the square root of something, you're actually supposed to get a positive number. So what happens is here, I would get absolute value of X1 equals absolute value of X2. And from this, we can't conclude that x1 is equal to x2. So if you start with this and try to do it with the squared one, you will get a, uh, uh, you won't be able to get to the conclusion that x1 is equal to x2. It seems like we're having some uh, flickering here. So let's take my, different things seem to work on different days. So uh, any questions about that? Actually, I'm going to end this meeting and we're going to switch over to the second part. So I'll see you on the other side.